The third day, Sunday, 5 December, the Red October. The Red October had no time of her own. For her, the sun neither rose nor set, and the days of the week had little significance. Unlike surface ships, which changed their clocks to conform with the local time wherever they were, submarines generally adhered to a single time reference. For American subs, this was Zulu, or Greenwich Mean Time. For the Red October, it was Moscow Standard Time, which by normal reckoning was actually one hour ahead of Standard Time to save on utility expenses. Ramius entered the control room in mid-morning. Their course was now 250, speed 13 knots, and the submarine was running 30 meters above the bottom at the west edge of the Barents Sea. In a few more hours, the bottom would drop away to an abyssal plain, allowing them to go much deeper. Ramius examined the chart first, then the numerous banks of instruments covering both side bulkheads in the compartment. Last, he made some notations in the order book. Lieutenant Ivanov, he said sharply to the junior officer of the watch. Yes, Comrade Captain. Ivanov was the greenest officer aboard, fresh from Lenin's Komsomol school in Leningrad, pale, skinny, and eager. I will be calling a meeting of the senior officers in the ward room. You will now be the officer of the watch. This is your first cruise, Ivanov. How do you like it? It is better than I had hoped, comrade captain, Ivanov replied with greater confidence than he could possibly have felt. That is good, comrade lieutenant. It is my practice to give junior officers as much responsibility as they can handle. While we senior officers are having our weekly political discussion, you are in command of this vessel. The safety of this ship and all his crew is your responsibility. You have been taught all you need to know, and my instructions are in the order book. If we detect another submarine or surface ship, you will inform me at once and instantly initiate evasion drill. Any questions? No, comrade captain. Ivanov was standing at rigid attention. Good, Ramia smiled. Pavel Ilyich, you will forever remember this as one of the great moments of your life. I know. I can still remember my first watch. Do not forget your orders or your responsibilities. Pride sparkled in the boy's eyes. It was too bad what would happen to him, Ramius thought, still the teacher. On first inspection, Ivanov looked to have the makings of a good officer. Ramius walked briskly aft to the ship's medical office. Good morning, doctor. Good morning to you, comrade captain. It is time for our political meeting. Petrov had been reading the manual for the sub's new X-ray machine. Yes, it is, comrade doctor, but I do not wish you to attend. There is something else I want you to do. While the senior officers are at the meeting, I have the three youngsters standing watch in control and the engineering spaces. Oh! Petrov's eyes went wide. It was his first time on a submarine in several years. Ramius smiled. Be at ease, comrade. I can get from the wardroom to control in twenty seconds, as you know, and comrade Melikin can get to his precious reactor just as fast. Sooner or later our young officers must learn to function on their own. I prefer that they learn sooner. I want you to keep an eye on them. I know that they all have the knowledge to do their duties. I want to know if they have the temperament. If Borodin or I watch over them, they will not act normally. And in any case, this is a medical judgment, no? Ah, you wish me to observe how they react to their responsibilities. Without the pressure of being observed by a senior line officer, Ramius confirmed. One must give young officers room to grow, but not too much. If you observe something that you question, you will inform me at once. There should be no problems. We are in open sea, there is no traffic about, and the reactor is running at a fraction of its total power. The first test for young officers ought to be an easy one. Find some excuse for traveling back and forth and keep an eye on the children. Ask questions about what they are doing. Petrov laughed at that. Ah! And also you would have me learn a few things, comrade captain? They told me about you at Severomorsk. Fine, it will be as you say. But this will be the first political meeting I have missed in years. From what your file says, you could teach party doctrine to the Politburo, Yevgeny Konstantinovich. Which said little about his medical ability, Ramius thought. The captain moved forward to the wardroom to join his brother officers who were waiting for him. The steward had left several pots of tea along with black bread and butter to snack on. Ramius looked at the corner of the table. The bloodstain had long since been wiped away, but he could remember exactly what it looked like. 
This, he reflected, was one difference between himself and the man he had murdered. Ramius had a conscience. Before taking his seat, he turned to lock the door behind him. His officers were all sitting at attention, since the compartment was not large enough for them to stand once the bench seats were folded down. Sunday was the normal day for the political awareness session at sea. Ordinarily, Poutine would have officiated, reading some Pravda editorials, followed by selected quotations from the works of Lenin, and a discussion of the lessons to be learned from the readings. It was very much like a church service. With the demise of the Zampolite, this duty devolved upon the commanding officer. But Ramius doubted that regulations anticipated this sort of discussion on today's agenda. Each officer in this room was a member of his conspiracy. Ramius outlined their plans. There had been some minor changes which he had not mentioned to anyone. Then he told them about the letter. So there is no going back, Borodin observed. We all have agreed upon our course of action. Now we are committed to it. Their reactions to his words were just what he expected them to be. Sober, as well they might be. All were single. No one left behind a wife or children. All were party members in good standing, their dues paid up to the end of the year, their party cards right where they were supposed to be, next to their hearts. And each one shared with his comrades a deep-seated dissatisfaction with, in some cases, a hatred of the Soviet government. The planning had begun soon after the death of his Natalia. The rage he had almost unknowingly suppressed throughout his life had burst forth with a violence and passion that he had struggled to contain. A lifetime of self-control had enabled him to conceal it, and a lifetime of naval training had enabled him to choose a purpose worthy of it. Ramius had not yet begun school when he first heard tales from other children about what his father Alexander had done in Lithuania in 1940, and after that country's dubious liberation from the Germans in 1944. These were the repeated whisperings of their parents. One little girl told Marco a story that he recounted to Alexander, and to the boy's uncomprehending horror, her father vanished. For his unwitting mistake, Marco was branded an informer. Stung by the name he was given for committing a crime which the state taught was not a crime at all, whose enormity never stopped pulling at his conscience. He never informed again. In the formative years of his life, while the elder Ramius ruled the Lithuanian Party Central Committee in Vilnius, the motherless boy was raised by his paternal grandmother, common practice in a country savaged by four years of brutal war. Her only son left home at an early age to join Lenin's Red Guards, and while he was away she kept to the old ways, going to Mass every day until 1940, and never forgetting the religious education that had been passed on to her. Ramius remembered her as a silver-haired old woman who told wonderful bedtime stories, religious stories. It would have been far too dangerous for her to bring Marco to the religious ceremonies that had never been entirely stamped out, but she did manage to have him baptized a Roman Catholic soon after his father had deposited him with her. She never told Marco about this. The risk would have been too great. Roman Catholicism had been brutally suppressed in the Baltic states. It was a religion, and as he grew older, Marco learned that Marxism-Leninism was a jealous god, tolerating no competing loyalties. Grandmother Hilda told him nighttime stories from the Bible, each with a lesson of right and wrong, virtue and reward. As a child, he found them merely entertaining, but he never told his father about them, because even then he knew that Alexander would object. After the elder Ramius again resumed control of his son's life, this religious education faded into Marco's memory neither fully remembered nor fully forgotten. As a boy, Ramius sensed more than thought that Soviet communism ignored a basic human need. In his teens, his misgivings began to take a coherent shape. The good of the people was a laudable enough goal, but in denying a man's soul, an enduring part of his being, Marxism stripped away the foundation of human dignity and individual value. It also cast aside the objective measure of justice and ethics, which, he decided, was the principal legacy of religion to civilized life. From earliest adulthood on, Marco had his own idea about right and wrong, an idea he did not share with the state. It gave him a means of gauging his actions and those of others. It was something he was careful to conceal. It served as an anchor for his soul, and like an anchor, it was hidden far below the visible surface. Even as the boy was grappling with his first doubts about his country, no one could have suspected it. Like all Soviet children, Ramius joined the Little Octoberists, then the Young Pioneers. 
He paraded at the requisite battle shrines in polished boots and blood-red scarf and gravely stood watch over the remains of some unknown soldier while clasping to his chest a deactivated PPSH submachine gun, his back ramrod straight before the eternal flame. The solemnity of such duty was no accident. As a boy, Marco was certain that the brave men whose graves he guarded so intensely had met their fates with this same sort of selfless heroism that he saw portrayed in endless war movies at the local cinema. They had fought the hated Germans to protect the women and children and old people behind the lines. And like a nobleman's son of an earlier Russia, he took special pride in being the son of a party chieftain. The party, he heard a hundred times before he was five, was the soul of the people. The unity of party, people, and nation was the holy trinity of the Soviet Union, albeit with one segment more important than the others. His father fit easily into the cinematic image of a party apparatchik, stern but fair, to Marco, he was a frequently absent, gruffly kind man who brought his son what presents he could and saw to it that he had all the advantages the son of a party secretary was entitled to. Although outwardly he was the model Soviet child, inwardly he wondered why what he learned from his father and in school conflicted with the other lessons of his youth. Why did some parents refuse to let their children play with him? Why, when he passed them, did his classmates whisper, Stukach, the cruel and bitter epithet of informer? His father and the party taught that informing was an act of patriotism, but for having done it once, he was shunned. He resented the taunts of his boyhood peers, but he never once complained to his father, knowing that this would be an evil thing to do. Something was very wrong, but what? He decided that he had to find the answers for himself. By choice, Marco became individual in his thinking, and so unknowingly committed the gravest sin in the communist pantheon. Outwardly the model of a party member's son, he played the game carefully and according to all the rules. He did his duty for all party organizations and was always the first to volunteer for the menial tasks allotted to children aspiring to party membership, which he knew was the only path to success or even comfort in the Soviet Union. He became good at sports, not team sports. He worked at track and field events in which he could compete as an individual and measure the performances of others. Over the years he learned to do the same in all of his endeavors, to watch and judge the actions of his fellow citizens and officers with cool detachment behind a blank face that concealed his conclusions. In the summer of his eighth year the course of his life was forever changed. When no one would play with the little Stukach, he would wander down to the fishing docks of the small village where his grandmother had made her home. A ragtag collection of old wooden boats sailed each morning always behind a screen of patrol boats manned by MGB, as the KGB was then known, border guards, to reap a modest harvest from the Gulf of Finland. Their catch supplemented the local diet with needed protein and provided a minuscule income for the fishermen. One boat captain was Old Sasha, an officer in the Tsar's Navy. He had revolted with the crew of the cruiser Avrora, helping to spark the chain of events that changed the face of the world. Marco did not learn until many years later that the crewmen of the Evrora had broken with Lenin and had been savagely put down by Red Guards. Sasha had spent twenty years in labor camps for his part in that collective indiscretion and only been released at the beginning of the Great Patriotic War. Rodina had found herself in need of experienced seamen to pilot ships into the ports of Murmansk and Archangel, to which the Allies were bringing weapons, food, and the sundries that allow a modern army to function. Sasha had learned his lesson in the Gulag. He did his duty efficiently and well, asking for nothing in return. After the war, he'd been given a kind of freedom for his services, the right to perform back-breaking work under perpetual suspicion. By the time Marco met him, Sasha was over sixty, a nearly bald man with ropey old muscles, a seaman's eye, and a talent for stories that left the youngster wide-eyed. He'd been a midshipman under the famous Admiral Makarov at Port Arthur in 1906. Probably the finest seaman in Russian history, Makarov's reputation as a patriot and an innovative fighting sailor was sufficiently unblemished that a communist government would eventually see fit to name a missile cruiser in his memory. At first wary of the boy's reputation, Sasha saw something in him that others missed. The boy without friends and the sailor without a family became comrades. Sasha spent hours telling and retelling the tale of how he had been on the Admiral's flagship, the Petropavlovsk, and participated in the one Russian victory over the hated Japanese, only to have his battleship sunk and his admiral killed by a mine while returning to port. After this, Sasha had led his seamen as naval infantry, winning three decorations for courage under fire. 
This experience, he waggled his fingers seriously at the boy, taught him of the mindless corruption of the Tsarist regime and convinced him to join one of the first naval Soviets when such action meant certain death at the hands of the Tsar's secret police, the Okhrana. He told his own version of the October Revolution from the thrilling perspective of an eyewitness, but Sasha was very careful to leave the later parts out. He allowed Marco to sail with him and taught him the fundamentals of seamanship that decided a boy, not yet nine, that his destiny lay on the sea. There was a freedom at sea he could never have on land. There was a romance about it that touched the man growing within the boy. There were also dangers. But in a summer-long series of simple, effective lessons, Sasha taught the boy that preparation, knowledge, and discipline can deal with any form of danger. That danger confronted properly is not something a man must fear. In later years, Marco would reflect often on the value this summer had held for him and wonder just how far Sasha's career might have led if other events had not cut it short. Marco told his father about Sasha towards the end of that long Baltic summer and even took him to meet the old sea dog. The elder Ramius was sufficiently impressed with him and what he had done for his son that he arranged for Sasha to have command of a newer, larger boat and moved him up on the list for a new apartment. Marco almost believed that the party could do a good deed, that he himself had done his first manly good deed. But old Sasha died the following winter, and the good deed came to nothing. Many years later, Marco realized that he hadn't known his friend's last name. Even after years of faithful service to the Rodina, Sasha had been an unperson. At thirteen, Marco traveled to Leningrad to attend the knock-him-off school. There he decided that he, too, would become a professional naval officer. Marco would follow the quest for adventure that had for centuries called young men to the sea. The Nakimov School was a special three-year prep school for youngsters aspiring to a career at sea. The Soviet Navy at that time was little more than a coastal defense force, but Marco wanted very much to be a part of it. His father urged him to a life of party work, promising rapid promotion, a life of comfort and privilege. But Marco wanted to earn whatever he received on his own merits, not to be remembered as an appendage of the liberator of Lithuania. And a life at sea offered romance and excitement that even made serving the state something he could tolerate. The Navy had little tradition to build on. Marco sensed that in it there was room to grow, and saw that many aspiring naval cadets were like himself, if not mavericks, than as close to mavericks as was possible in a society so closely controlled as his own. The teenager thrived with his first experience of fellowship. Nearing graduation, his class was exposed to the various components of the Russian fleet. Ramius at once fell in love with submarines. The boats at that time were small, dirty, and smelled from the open bilges that the crews used as a convenient latrine. At the same time, submarines were the only offensive arm that the Navy had, and from the first, Marco wanted to be on the cutting edge. He'd had enough lectures on naval history to know that submarines had twice nearly strangled England's maritime empire and had successfully emasculated the economy of Japan. This had greatly pleased him. He was glad the Americans had crushed the Japanese Navy that had so nearly killed his mentor. He graduated from the Nakimov School first in his class winner of the gold-plated sextant for his mastery of theoretical navigation. As leader of his class, Marco was allowed the school of his choice. He selected the Higher Naval School for Underwater Navigation, named for Lenin's Komsomol, VVMUPP, still the principal submarine school of the Soviet Union. His five years at VVMUPP were the most demanding of his life, the more so since he was determined not to succeed but to excel. He was first in his class in every subject, in every year. His essay on the political significance of Soviet naval power was forwarded to Sergei Zhergievich Gorshkov, then commander-in-chief of the Baltic fleet, and clearly the coming man in the Soviet Navy. Gorshkov had seen the essay published in Morskoy Spordnik, Naval Collections, the leading Soviet naval journal. It was a model of progressive party thought, quoting Lenin six different times. By this time, Marco's father was a candidate member of the Presidium, as the Politburo was then called, and very proud of his son. The elder Ramius was no one's fool. He finally recognized that the Red Fleet was a growing flower, and that his son would someday have a position of importance in it. His influence moved his son's career rapidly along. By thirty, Marco had his first command and a new wife. Natalia Bogdanova was the daughter of another Presidium member whose diplomatic duties had taken him and his family all over the world. 
Natalia had never been a healthy girl. They had no children. There are three attempts, each ending in miscarriage, the last of which had nearly killed her. She was a pretty, delicate woman, sophisticated by Russian standards, who polished her husband's passable English with American and British books, politically approved ones to be sure, mainly the thoughts of Western leftists, but also a smattering of genuine literature, including Hemingway, Twain, and Upton Sinclair. Along with his naval career, Natalia had been the center of his life. Their marriage, punctuated by prolonged absences and joyous returns, made their love even more precious than it might have been. When construction began on the first class of Soviet nuclear-powered submarines, Marco found himself in the yards learning how the steel sharks were designed and built. He was soon known as a very hard man to please as a junior quality control inspector. His own life, he was aware, would ride on the workmanship of these often drunk welders and fitters. He became an expert in nuclear engineering, spent two years as a star bomb, and then received his first nuclear command. She was a November-class attack submarine, the first crude attempt by the Soviets to make a battle-worthy long-range attack boat to threaten Western navies and lines of communication. Not a month later, a sister ship suffered a major reactor casualty off the Norwegian coast, and Marco was first to arrive on the scene. As ordered, he successfully rescued the crew, then sank the disabled sub lest Western navies learn her secrets. Both tasks he performed expertly and well, a noteworthy tour de force for a young commander. Good performance was something he had always felt it was important to reward in his subordinates, and the fleet commander at that time felt the same way. Marco soon moved on to a new Charlie One class sub. It was men like Ramius who went out to challenge the Americans and the British. Marco took few illusions with him. The Americans, he knew, had long experience in naval warfare. Their own greatest fighter, Jones, had once served the Russian Navy for the Tsaritsa Catherine. Their submariners were legendary for their craftiness. And Ramius found himself pitted against the last of the war-trained Americans, men who had endured the sweaty fear of underwater combat and utterly defeated a modern Navy. The deadly serious game of hide-and-seek he played with them was not an easy one the less so because they had submarines years ahead of Soviet designs. But it was not a time without a few victories. Ramius gradually learned to play the game by American rules, training his officers and men with care. His crews were rarely as prepared as he wished, still the Soviet Navy's greatest problem. But where other commanders cursed their men for their failings, Marco corrected the failings of his men. His first Charlie-class submarine was called the Vilnius Academy, this was partially a slur against his half-Lithuanian blood, though, since he had been born in Leningrad of a great Russian, his internal passport designated him as that, but mainly recognition that officers came to him half-trained and left him ready for advancement and eventual command. The same was true of his conscripted crewmen. Ramius did not permit the hazing and low-level terrorism normal throughout the Soviet military. He saw his task as the building of seamen, and he produced a greater percentage of re-enlistments than any other submarine commander. A full ninth of the Mishmanyi in the Northern Fleet submarine force were Ramius-trained professionals. His brother submarine commanders were delighted to take aboard his Starshini, and more than one advanced to officer's school. After 18 months of hard work and diligent training, Marco and his Vilnius Academy were ready to play their game of fox and hounds. He happened upon the USS Triton in the Norwegian Sea and hounded her mercilessly for twelve hours. Later he would note with no small satisfaction that the Triton was soon thereafter retired because it was said the oversized vessel had proven unable to deal with the newer Soviet designs. The diesel-powered submarines of the British and the Norwegians that he occasionally happened to cross while snorkeling he dogged ruthlessly, often subjecting them to vicious sonar lashing. Once he even acquired an American missile submarine, managing to maintain contact with her for nearly two hours before she vanished like a ghost into the black waters. The rapid growth of the Soviet Navy and the need for qualified officers during his early career prevented Ramius from attending the Frunze Academy. This was normally a sine qua non of career advancement in all of the Soviet armed services. Frunze, in Moscow near the old Novodovichy Monastery, was named for a hero of the revolution. It was the premier school for those who aspired to high command, and though Ramius had not attended it as a student, his prowess as an operational commander won him an appointment as an instructor. It was something earned solely on merit, for which his highly placed father was not responsible. That was important to Ramius. The head of the naval section at Frunze liked to introduce Marco as our test pilot of submarines. 
His classes became a prime attraction not only for the naval officers in the academy, but also for the many others who came to hear his lectures on naval history and maritime strategy. On weekends, spent at his father's official dacha in the village of Zhukova I, he wrote manuals for submarine operations and the training of crews, and specifications for the ideal attack submarine. Some of his ideas had been controversial enough to upset his erstwhile sponsor, Gorshkov, by this time commander-in-chief of the entire Soviet Navy. But the old admiral was not entirely displeased. Ramius proposed that officers in the submarine service should work in a single class of ship, better yet the same ship, for years, the better to learn their profession and the capabilities of their vessels. Skilled captains, he suggested, should not be forced to leave their commands for desk-bound promotions. Here he lauded the Red Army's practice of leaving a field commander in his post so long as the man wanted it, and deliberately contrasted his view on this matter with the practice of imperialist navies. He stressed the need for extended training in the fleet, for longer service enlisted men, and for better living conditions on submarines. For some of his ideas he found a sympathetic ear in the high command. For others he did not. And thus Ramius found himself destined never to have his own admiral's flag. By this time he did not care. He loved his submarines too much ever to leave them for a squadron or even a fleet command. After finishing at Frunze, he did indeed become a test pilot of submarines. Marco Ramius, now a captain first rank, would take out the first ship of every submarine class to write the book on its strengths and weaknesses, to develop operational routines and training guidelines. The first of the Alphas was his, the first of the Deltas and Typhoons. Aside from one extraordinary mishap on an Alpha, his career had been one uninterrupted story of achievement. Along the way, he became the mentor of many young officers. He often wondered what Sasha would have thought as he taught the demanding art of submarine operations to scores of eager young men. Many of them had already become commanding officers themselves. More had failed. Ramius was a commander who took good care of those who pleased him, and took good care of those who did not. Another reason why he had never made admiral was his unwillingness to promote officers whose fathers were as powerful as his own, but whose abilities were unsatisfactory. He never played favorites where duty was concerned, and the sons of a half-dozen high party officials received unsatisfactory fitness reports despite their active performance in weekly party discussions. Most had become Zampoliti. It was this sort of integrity that earned him trust in fleet command, when a really tough job was at hand, Ramius's name was usually the first to be considered for it. Also along the way, he had gathered to himself a number of young officers whom he and Natalia virtually adopted. They were surrogates for the family Marco and his wife never had. Ramius found himself shepherding men, much like himself, with long-suppressed doubts about their country's leadership. He was an easy man to talk to, once a man had proven himself. To those with political doubts, those with just grievances, he gave the same advice. Join the party. Nearly all were already Komsomol members, of course, and Marco urged them to take the next step. This was the price of a career at sea, and guided by their own craving for adventure, most officers paid that price. Remius himself had been allowed to join the party at eighteen, the earliest possible age, because of his father's influence. His occasional talks at weekly party meetings were perfect recitations of the party line. It wasn't hard, he'd tell his officers patiently. All you had to do was repeat what the party said, just change the words around slightly. This was much easier than navigation. One had only to look at the political officer to see that. Ramius became known as a captain whose officers were both proficient and models of political conformity. He was one of the best party recruiters in the Navy. Then his wife died. Ramius was in port at the time, not unusual for a missile subcommander, he had his own dacha in the woods west of Polyarny, his own Jaguli automobile, the official car and driver those with his command station enjoyed, and numerous other creature comforts that came with his rank and his parentage. He was a member of the party elite, so when Natalia had complained of abdominal pain, going to the fourth department clinic which served only the privileged had been a natural mistake. There was a saying in the Soviet Union, Flores parquet, docks okay. He'd last seen his wife alive, lying on a gurney, smiling as she was wheeled towards the operating room. The surgeon on call had arrived at the hospital late and drunk, and allowed himself too much time breathing pure oxygen to sober up before starting the simple procedure of removing an inflamed appendix. The swollen organ burst just as he was retracting tissue to get at it. A case of peritonitis immediately followed. 
complicated by the perforated bowel the surgeon caused in his clumsy haste to repair the damage. Natalia was placed on antibiotic therapy, but there was a shortage of medicine. The foreign, usually French, pharmaceuticals used in fourth department clinics had run out. Soviet antibiotics, plan medications, were substituted. It was a common practice in Soviet industry for workers to earn bonuses by manufacturing goods over the usual quota, goods that bypassed what quality control existed in Soviet industry. This particular batch of medication had never been inspected or tested, and the vials had probably been filled with distilled water instead of antibiotics, Marco learned the next day. Natalia had lapsed into deep shock and coma, dying before the series of errors could be corrected. The funeral was appropriately solemn, Remius remembered bitterly. Brother officers from his own command and over a hundred other Navy men whom he had befriended over the years were there, along with members of Natalia's family and representatives of the local party central committee. Marco had been at sea when his father died, and because he had known the extent of Alexander's crimes, the loss had had little effect. His wife's death, however, was nothing less than a personal catastrophe. Soon after they had married, Natalia had joked that every sailor needs someone to return to, that every woman needs someone to wait for. It had been as simple as that, and infinitely more complex. The marriage of two intelligent people who had over fifteen years learned each other's foibles and strengths and grown ever closer. Marco Ramius watched the coffin roll into the cremation chamber to the somber strain of a classical requiem, wishing that he could pray for Natalia's soul, hoping that Grandmother Hilda had been right, that there was something beyond the steel door and mass of flame. Only then did the full weight of the event strike him. The state had robbed him of more than his wife. It had robbed him of a means to assuage his grief with prayer. It had robbed him of the hope, if only an illusion, of ever seeing her again. Natalia, gentle and kind, had been his only happiness since that Baltic summer long ago. Now that happiness was gone forever. As the weeks and months wore on, he was tormented by her memory. A certain hairstyle, a certain walk, a certain laugh encountered on the streets or in the shops of Murmansk was all it took to thrust Natalia back to the forefront of his consciousness. And when he was thinking of his loss, he was not a professional naval officer. The life of Natalia Bogdanova Remius had been lost at the hands of a surgeon who had been drinking while on call, a court-martial offense in the Soviet Navy. But Marco could not have the doctor punished. The surgeon was himself the son of a party chieftain, his status secured by his own sponsors. Her life might have been saved by proper medication, but there had not been enough foreign drugs, and Soviet pharmaceuticals were untrustworthy. The doctor could not be made to pay. The pharmaceutical workers could not be made to pay. The thought echoed back and forth across his mind, feeding his fury until he decided that the state would be made to pay. The idea had taken weeks to form and was the product of a career of training and contingency planning. When the construction of the Red October was restarted after a two-year hiatus, Ramius knew that he would command her. He had helped with the designing of her revolutionary drive system and had inspected the model which had been running on the Caspian Sea for some years in absolute secrecy. He asked for relief from his command so that he could concentrate on the construction and outfitting of the October and select and train his officers beforehand, the earlier to get the missile sub into full operation. The request was granted by the commander of the Red Banner Northern Fleet, a sentimental man who had also wept at Natalia's funeral. Ramius had already known who his officers would be, all graduates of the Vilnius Academy, many the sons of Marco and Natalia. They were men who owed their place and their rank to Ramius, men who cursed the inability of their country to build submarines worthy of their skills, men who had joined the party as told, and then become even more dissatisfied with the motherland as they learned that the price of advancement was to prostitute one's mind and soul, to become a highly paid parrot in a blue jacket whose every party recitation was a grating exercise in self-control. For the most part, they were men for whom this degrading step had not borne fruit. In the Soviet Navy, there were three routes to advancement. A man could become a Zampolit and be a pariah among his peers, or he could be a navigation officer and advance to his own command, or he could be shunted into a specialty in which he would gain rank and pay, but never command. Thus, a chief engineer on a Soviet naval vessel could outrank his commanding officer and still be his subordinate. Ramius looked around the table at his officers. 
most had not been allowed to pursue their own career goals despite their proficiency and despite their party membership. The minor infractions of youth, in one case an act committed at age eight, prevented two from ever being trusted again. With the missile officer it was because he was a Jew. Though his parents had always been committed believing communists, neither they nor their son was ever trusted. Another officer's elder brother had demonstrated against the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 and disgraced his whole family. Malikin, the chief engineer and Ramius's equal in rank, had never been allowed the route to command simply because his superiors wanted him to be an engineer. Borodin, who was ready for his own command, had once accused a Zampolit of homosexuality. The man he had informed on was the son of the chief Zampolit of the Northern Fleet. There are many paths to treason. And what if they locate us? Kamarov speculated. I doubt that even the Americans can find us when the Caterpillar is operating. I am certain that our own submarines cannot. Comrades, I helped design this ship, Ramia said. What will become of us? the missile officer muttered. First, we must accomplish the task at hand. An officer who looks too far ahead stumbles over his own boots. They will be looking for us, Borodin said. Of course, Ramia smiled, but they will not know where to look until it is too late. Our mission, comrades, is to avoid detection, and so we shall.